Can you please give us a little quick snapshot on, on the current state of globalization and as you see the, uh, the impact of uh, recent political developments on the de globalization stage? Well, clearly the new U.S. administration has taken a very strong position, not necessarily against globalization, but in terms of, as the new president said, putting America first. Now, this is a nationalistic policy, which historically is in fact not new. That is, the United States has had policies like this in the past, particularly the beginning of the last century. What is new and is quite troubling is that normally we argue that these types of policies are the policies that are appropriate for developing countries. That is, the countries that are in the periphery relative to the advanced countries. And we have a theory of so-called catching up in which the developing countries take over the types of activities that the developed countries no longer use as the basis of their economy because they're using technical progress to advance their productive structure. Now, in this particular case, we have the U.S., which is the advanced economy, arguing that they are going to be using the policies that would normally be used by developing countries. So if we put it in the context of a well-known Japanese theory, the idea of the, of the flying geese, the idea is that the first goose undertakes rapid technical progress and moves up the technology production scale so that they leave behind particular types of activities. And in particular, those activities tend to be in manufacturing. So what we now have is basically the lead goose that is turning around and saying, we are no longer going to be willing to give up manufacturing in certain low-level technologies, and we are going to try to protect those, which means that we now have inherently a conflict in terms of the traditional way we analyze the progress of industrialized and developing countries. So that this raises a, a certain, as I say, cognitive dissonance in terms of the policy of the U.S. relative to the policies of developing countries. And in particular, in Latin America, which is using a policy of development, which has been based and particularly has been developed in Cipal, of using a domestic strategy of increased industrialization and increased manufacturing to offset the negative aspects of the declining terms of trade, this represents something of a challenge and a problem in terms of formulating policy. And these are the sorts of things that uh, we've been looking at in, this, uh, in these sessions. Thank you very much. So in this new global context and with the, the perspective that you just uh, laid forth, what are the main challenges and opportunities for Latin America as a middle income country, uh, region, uh, as a region more, uh, as a development and transition region? What do you think are the main uh, challenges at stake? Now, I think we can summarize the challenges that are raised by uh, the U.S. policies in two very simple terms. The first is that if the United States decides to, in a sense, reindustrialize, that is to become the dominant manufacturing producer, does this mean that it's going to be more difficult for developing countries to build up their own domestic manufacturing sectors and their domestic industrialization? So this is the side on the uh, manufacturing. The second is that if the U.S. decides to take a more nationalistic policy, does it mean that international financial institutions are going to be looking more towards investment in the United States rather than investments in developing countries? So this we could talk about in terms of what would be the disintermediation of the global financial system. And both of these trends obviously would be very detrimental to Latin American countries. Now, my own personal opinion is that the new administration is not going to be very successful in providing a reindustrialization of the U.S. economy, basically because this means that it's going to be supporting those areas of the economy that provide less growth and provide less technical progress and therefore provide less income and job growth. And this is what the policy is supposed to do. So I don't think in particular this is a great risk for, uh, for developing countries. On the side of 
the financial disintermediation, the financial disintermediation also would require a certain amount of success in US policies. And in fact, if these policies are not successful, then we really can say, well, this the, the disintermediation is probably not a risk. Now, having said that, I think it's important in the context of the idea of increasing globalization and the spread of technical progress to ask the question whether or not it is sensible for developing countries to believe that their policy should be centered on a emphasis of building up manufacturing and if they should continue to rely on external financing, that is inter international financialization, in order to support that process. And here, this is the, the impact of technology. What we find, and much of the discussion that we've had in the, in the seminar, is that if we look at the impact of technical progress, Technical progress, in fact, provides very strong benefits, but it also creates increasing output per man, which means that it reduces the demand for labor. So that policies that are looking to solve unemployment problems, which is the basic problem that developing countries face, simply looking at manufacturing in the context of the new digital technologies says that probably this is no longer going to be the solution that we thought it was 30 or 40 years ago. So the first lesson I think we have to take into account is that we have to look beyond simple manufacturing as a solution for the structural changes and to look more broadly at the way technology is changing the employment creating capacity of sectoral changes in the economy on the first level. The second is that if we look at financialization, in fact, financialization, the way it works, in general, has been to support the center relative to the periphery. So that if we continue to have the very strong dominance of US financial institutions, those US financial institutions are always going to be investing in those areas that are producing the greatest profits for their shareholders. And their shareholders happen to be almost all in developed countries. So the second point is that if developing countries, and in particular if developing countries in Latin America, are going to be designing industrial strategies that are now looking more directly towards employment creation rather than simply emphasizing manufacturing or services, they're going to have to have more autonomy in terms of their domestic financing, which means that they're going to have to have increasing controls over the impact of foreign capital inflows and in particular in foreign direct investors because foreign direct investors are not always going to be interested in maximizing employment, they're going to be interested in maximizing their returns relative to their domestic economies. So that I would argue that the new policies in the United States are probably a very good indication that developing countries should be taking much stronger steps to develop industrial strategies that move beyond the simple emphasis on manufacturing. If the United States wants to be the center of manufacturing, we're certainly happy to let them do it. We would rather develop those new techniques and those new strategies that come from the digital revolution rather than the financialization and the emphasis on manufacturing. The second is that in order to do this, we have to have more control over domestic economies. And if you look at one of the basic elements of nationalistic development policies under the, uh, uh, the global conditions of the 19th century, was to say, well, effectively the gold standard is what prevents us from developing our own independent strategies because the gold standard meant that every time you had a condition in which you tended to expand too rapidly, you always had to protect the amount of gold supplies. So we said getting rid of the gold standard was the way of getting national monetary sovereignty. Well, we don't have the gold standard anymore. We now have completely open international financial markets, but the paradox is that having done that has created constraints that are just as strong as the gold standard. 
okay if the international investors decide an economy is not developing sufficiently well what are they going to do we get the so-called capital reversal and the capital reversal then produces a financial crisis so that if we're going to have def effective national industrial strategies and policies there's going to have to be number one control over foreign capital inflows and particular controls on FDI which as we know China has used very effectively in developing their own economy and secondly to build up domestic financial institutions and if we look at one of the characteristics in the last 15 to 20 years in Latin America has been the absolute decline in domestically owned financial institutions and this is a very important area in which a national development strategy will require either a strong national financial system or some sort of financial development bank.